Aloha, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us for Queen's free Speaking of Health lecture series. Tonight's lecture is called Sarcoma, the Forgotten Cancer. And you're ahead of the game because July is actually National Sarcoma Awareness Month. So you're going to get to know more about it even before the month hits. My name is Lisa Sakia. I'm with Queen's Health Systems. And on behalf of Queen's, I want to welcome you all this evening. It is my pleasure. I want to introduce to you three people this evening. And first, I want to introduce you to Dr. Shane Marita. Dr. Marita, if you could stand, please. He is our medical director of surgical oncology here at the Queen's Medical Center. He is also an MD Anderson uh, Cancer Network certified physician. He was born and raised in Hilo, and he graduated, and he's very proud to say this, he's graduated from Waikia Waina Elementary School. Yes, it is elementary school. He received his MD from the John A. Burns School of Medicine, also known as JAPSA. He completed his internship and residency at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He re returned home to be with his father uh, after his father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So he too has had cancer affecting his life. He subsequently performed fellowships at the National Cancer Institute, National Institutes of Health, and at John Hopkins Hospital, John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Also at Jobsum, John A. Burns School of Medicine, he earned an MS and he studied thyroid cancer in Filipinos and attained a PhD investigating melanoma in the native Hawaiian people Pacific Islander population. He's an associate professor of surgery at Jobsum, faculty in the clinical and translational sciences program for the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, and he's also the chair of the Hawaii Comprehensive Cancer Coalition. He is married to, when you say, is there a doctor in the house in his family, you can say, yes, there's two. So he's married to Dr. Jamie Tom, who is an emergency physician, and he's also to a father, a father of three sons, Josiah, Elijah, and Zechariah. His mother, Sun, also lives in Honolulu. That is Dr. Shane Marita. Our special guest for this evening is, the first one is Donnie Esposito, if I could have you stand. She's going to be sharing about her journey with this condition. Uh, her background includes work, sales work. She's a salesperson at Hawaii News Now. She was doing that for eight years. And then also at Cox Radio, she was doing sales there for 15 years. And you know, when I first heard from Dr. Marita about this condition, I was like, sarcoma. Okay, I don't know anyone. I don't know what sarcoma is. I don't know anyone who has this condition. And then when he told me who was going to be talking, Donnie, I worked with Donnie at Cox Radio. So it's like, I do know someone with, with sarcoma. It is out there in the community, and chances are, maybe you'd know someone too. Uh, she is also a volunteer at hospice, and she is a Roosevelt grad. Is it go governors? Or did I just totally... Rough oh, good Lord. Yeah. So sorry, go Rough Riders. I'm going to get lots of hate mail now. Uh, our other guest this evening is David Lopes, Jr., He went to Farrington High. <laughs> go Governors. I'm going to say go Rough Riders. No, go Governors. He worked at Makaha Elementary for 17 years, and for nine of those years, he was a part-time teacher, and he was teaching Hawaiian studies. Okay, who loves to read in this audience? He does. He's got 20,000 books in his hard drive, and he's gone through 7,000 of those. So at this time, I'd like to start off with Dr. Shane Marita. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. Thank you all also for Ms. Esposito and Mr. Lopes for being here and sharing their, their stories. Um, very powerful. Um, I think these are the, the heroes. It takes a lot of bravery to share your experience with the public. Uh, it's not easy. I get the easy job. I, I come to work. I get to operate on, on people and try to make a small difference. But they have the rough uh, job of trying to battle this, this disease that often gets overlooked. Um, it's called the forgotten cancer. It's been, it's been coined by many survivors of sarcoma. And all the ones that they've, 
that been affected by it. Um, July, as Lisa mentioned, is Sarcoma Awareness Month, so this is a prelude to um, a lot of, uh, you're going to see a lot of public uh, sort of attention towards it, but again, it's, fair, it's relatively rare. Today we're going to go over just some a background. I mean, I'm going to talk probably no more than 25 minutes because I think their testimony, their stories are going to be much more impactful than hearing me uh, talk tonight, quite honestly. But I'm going to give you a background of the condition, uh, give you some principles that are important, what I like to uh, look at when I see someone with sarcoma, go over some scenarios, so real-life cases, de-identified, I took out all of my um, <clears throat> surgical photos uh, because no, I don't want to permit that. Uh, I, it's not, it might be something a little bit too gory for some folks. Uh, I'll give you some patient perspectives uh, that, um, you know, are, are here today, which I think is the most, like I said, impactful. And we're going to have an interactive discussion. Please feel free to answer, um, to ask any question. No question is stupid, and I'm not saying that to sound corny, but there really is no dumb question because I think um, it's important to ask what, whatever's on your mind, and, you know, if it's controversial, that's fine but I think it's important that we all be transparent. So I'll do my best to do this very succinctly. So before we get started in, in saying what sarcoma is, I will tell you that it's been in the media quite a bit. Um, this, I just did a, a search and uh, it's been pretty much all over Hawaii news now. Uh, child's uh, diagnosis, uh, mother is taking a crusade, this, this child was diagnosed with a sarcoma. Uh, sarcomas are much more common in children than adults. In adults, it's 1% of all cancers. In children, it's 15%. So this mother went to D.C. to try to encourage uh, folks to potentially fund uh, patients who have uh, sarcoma or are affected by it. Um, you've also probably heard in the news about a fire station that three children of firefighters in the same station diagnosed with sarcoma. And if you haven't, then you should look up Hawaiian News now, and they have that. Um, also, what was mentioned about a UH uh, student who in the past uh, needed to get some treatment uh, to fight his sarcoma. So. Uh, it's been, although it's a rare condition, relatively speaking, it's made quite a bit of uh, headlines. Now, someone always asks me, how do I know I have a sarcoma? And, you know, in Hawaii, a lot of people like to golf. I, I don't. I hate to golf. But I think it's important to try to give you an idea of when you should be worried about a potential Sarcoma. I'm not saying every single lump that you feel is a sarcoma. I'm just saying just pay attention to it. So I bring up a golf ball because, you know, there, I've done a lot of reviews. and In fact, I'm actually writing an article on sarcoma that I'm actually behind on, but um, I have to get done by the end of the month. But uh, I'm writing an article on sarcoma, and part of writing is trying to educate. So in, in, in speaking, I wanted to let you know, well, what could give me give you an idea what you should worry about it, like what size, and it's basically a golf ball. So the studies in the literature, when you have a sarcoma, a tumor that's around four centimeters of mass, you should really think about a sarcoma. You should also think about a sarcoma if it's firm or if it's growing rapidly. So most sarcomas, I'll give you, um, you know, an overview shortly regarding the distribution, but most of them come from soft tissue. Uh, it's more commonly presents as a lump under the skin or someone will feel a lump within the abdomen. By that time, it tends to be quite large and I'll give you some, some, some photos and cases of that. But if you notice a lump and it's big and you may say, well, how big? Get a golf ball, look at a golf ball. If it's the size of a golf ball, go and see somebody because it needs to be biopsied, especially if it's firm and especially if it's growing rapidly. Now, not everything is going to be a sarcoma. Chances are it is not, but I don't want you to ignore this. So if you learn one thing from me is don't forget a golf ball. Um, 
how did we come from the term sarcoma? It's from the Greek word uh, sarcoma with a K that means a fleshy substance. These are cancers. Sarcomas are cancers. They come from the, the mesoderm. If you remember embryology, which I didn't care for, quite honestly, the mesoderm is the middle part of the embryo. There's an ectoderm and a mesoderm and an endoderm. So the ectoderm is the covering of this embryo. Skin and, and the brain will be derived from it. And the endoderm is the inside of the embryo. Tissues such as lung and, and the intestines will develop. But mesoderm, that's where a lot of the connective tissue, the, the, the fat cells, blood vessels, uh, muscular tissue, bone, cartilage, all that uh, will, will, will come from uh, the mesoderm. And it comes from this, type, this, this layer of the embryo. There's many types. There's some literature that says there's more than 50. There's some I've seen more than 100. There's, um, is, it makes it very difficult to treat. It's so what we call heterogeneous. Um, there's only about 15,000 cases a year that, are, that um, happen in the United States. As a comparison, in colorectal cancer, it's over 150,000, so less than tenfold uh, relative to the other more common cancers. That's why it doesn't get as much attention, quite honestly. Uh, about 5,000 patients die a year from sarcoma. When I was reviewing um, some data at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center through Hawaii uh, Tumor Registry, Michael Green, who, who sort of keeps everything in check, he had told me that about, um, we, we see about 100 cases of sarcomas a year in Hawaii. Um, we all know, I already said it's rare in, in adults, but in children it's much, much more common. So there's many different types, but I will tell you a lot of the types will derive from the cell, the type of cell that it's coming from. But for this purpose of, of the talk, I'm going to be talking a lot about soft tissue sarcoma because it's much more common, it's much more what I deal with as a surgical oncologist. Orthopedists tend to deal with uh, osteosarcomas, which are involve the bone. So about 12.5% of all sarcomas are derived from the bone. The rest are from soft tissue. What is a soft tissue? A blood vessel, the lining of a blood vessel, the lining of uh, an organ such as the stomach, and I'll, I'll give you cases of that, or even the bladder. It's that connected, that supporting structure. It could be fat cells. It could be, it could be um, muscular tissue, smooth muscle. It could be skeletal muscle. So those are all, there's many different types. That's why it makes it very difficult to treat sometimes. Um, this is just a schema uh, showing you just the numerous uh, uh, types. Now people always ask me, how can I prevent getting a sarcoma? And for example, if for different cancers, it's pretty straightforward for the vast majority. For example, lung cancer, we're always asked about, you know, if, if the patient smoked or someone with melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer, did you get a bad sunburn or did you go to a tanning booth growing up? But there's a lot of risk factors in sarcoma that we can't really control as humans, you know. Um, some people have gotten sarcoma because of radiation. So I took care of a gentleman who had, he's had three cancers. He had a type of leukemia growing up. For that, he got chemotherapy, but they also gave him full body radiation. And radi radiation, but remember, it causes all kinds of changes in your DNA. And what happens over time is that these changes lead to, can lead to cancer. So if you had radiation in the past, your risk factor for sarco sarcoma. If you've had uh, AIDS, anyone exposed to AIDS, they've had the herpes virus, that can lead to sarcoma. Genetic syndrome, so-called hereditary. Uh, there's a syndrome called Lefromini, where two scientists from the National Institutes of Health described um, patients who, who have a constellation of different types of cancers, all related to a gene called P53, which is a tumor suppressor gene, and so that can lead to one to get sarcoma. There's a condition called neurofibromatosis, where patients get a freckling of their skin and they can get all nodules on, on, you know, on their body, but that could predispose one to sarcoma. Lymphedema, for example, uh, someone who's had breast cancer surgery and they've had swelling of their lymph nodes from surgery and, uh, and just 
having that chronic, chronic, chronic swelling can lead to a sarcoma. But those are, for the most part, you can't really control. You know, it's you need the radiation to get the cancer treatment. You've got the infection, unfortunately. Your genetic syndromes, you can't really control that. You're born with it or it's passed down. Uh, lymphedema, you needed to get breast cancer surgery, it just developed swelling and it was just, you know, long term. But some chemicals, maybe some chemicals, there may be some data about chemicals. What chemicals are I talking about? These, this has been looked upon for many years. These studies are from the 1970s and more recently in the early 2000s about certain toxins, certain di uh, dioxins, certain herbicides. These are studies that were done in, in Europe. Also, um, there's been meta-analyses done where folks, researchers have taken a look at the literature saying what may cause sarcomas, are there any associations or certain chemicals, but again, a, a lot of it is linked to herbicides, but no one knows for sure. We don't have hard data. I can't tell you that if you go and, and get exposure to Roundup, you're going to get sarcomas, but there is definitely some concerns that you know, people are looking at investigating it. Again, it's, it, there's some controversy over that. But the, the statement that was I'm quoting here is a possibility of a hazard cannot be confidently ruled out. Basically, it's like, okay, we're not sure, but again, there definitely is something a concern. Now, when we talk about prognosis, what does that mean? It basically means, am I going to live or die? Is it going to come back or is it not going to come back if I get diagnosed with a sarcoma? And like, unlike other types of cancers, grade is really important. And what does that mean? Grade is when a healthcare provider looks under the microscope, they can see how aggressive it looks. Does it look similar to the, that particular cell? And I have some pictures of that, of, of, of microscopic pictures. Or does it look completely like not even related. So grade and more so than any other cancers really drives whether or not someone's going to, what's their chance of living or dying in, in sarcomas. And I'll tell you all of these things about prognosis, statistics, it is, it's statistics. It doesn't mean that this is going to happen for sure. It just gives us a general idea of what potentially may happen. But there are people that are alive that you swear are not going to be around and they're living miracles, and I see that every day. And that's why I make, well, that's why I make uh, you know, this, this job is very humbling. Um, and it's also very refreshing because it doesn't always follow what the books tell us. This is an example of low-grade for or high-grade high sarcoma. So this is what's called liposarcoma. Lipo because fat. You probably heard of liposuction. God knows there's enough commercials about it, but lipo is fat. And so this is a, uh, a patient, this is a mic microscopic uh, photo. These are fat cells here. And you notice they look relatively, you can look at it and go, yeah, it kind of looks like fat. So this is low grade. So that means in general, much less chance of death. So if you get one thing tonight, low grade, lower chance of death, high grade, higher chance of death. Not guaranteed death, but higher chance. It's all statistics, right? And high grade here, it doesn't really look like fat. It looks angry. It looks very disorganized. So this is something that, again, the same type of cancer, liposarcoma, but just different grades. So when you go in, if you ever get diagnosed or someone uh, you know gets diagnosed, always ask about the grade because the, the grade can affect not only your prognosis but also your treatment. One may get chemotherapy, radiation, um, instead of just surgery alone. And I'll, ha I'll show you um, a, a figure for that a little bit later on. And there's all types of nomograms that are used in a way to try, try to calculate what's some, the chance of it coming back because that gives us an idea with respect to recurrence. How closely do we need to monitor patients? Do we need to give them additional medications or, or adjuncts besides surgery alone? Because I'll tell you, for the most part, surgery is the cornerstone. You want to remove the, the cancer. There's a type of sarcoma that's become much more frequent now. It's called a GI stromal tumor, and that comes from the intestine. It, it specifically comes from the cell, the pacemaker cell, called the interstitial cell of Kajal, C-A-J-A-L. And it's become much more common. And why it got a lot of news is that 
a certain drug called Gleevec, also known as imatinib, was found to <clears throat> provide a remarkable response in a patient, and now it's, it's FDA approved to treat this type of cancer. And it's, it was one of the first types of cancers that have been treated with, with, this, with a pill. So um, knowing what type of sarcoma it is is extremely important. Behavior, I'll just tell you that it's extremely variable. I, I wanted to just emphasize that grade, grade is extremely important. Why, again, low grade, less chance of spread, high grade, higher chance of spread, and also it coming, returning back to where it originated from. Extremities, typically, if it is from the extremities, it goes to the lungs. Uh, if it's in deep in your abdomen, it can go to the liver. I will tell you there's some types that like to go to the bone or some types that go to the lymph nodes, and we're going to hear someone who had um, involvement of the lymph nodes because sarcomas, like I said, are very heterogeneous. They behave very differently. It's important to have a, a team of experts to, who are used to taking care of sarcomas. It's extremely variable. Uh, the keys, really, I wanted to make, I like, I, like, I like to keep things very simple, and I just like, um, I want people to walk away and say, what, what, what do I want? So I always try to think, okay, three things. Get the correct diagnosis. It's extremely important because I will tell you, sometimes people can get misdiagnosed or someone may get um, so, sort of, you, you want to get the right opinion from someone who's used to taking care of sarcoma patients. Enlist a team of providers and make sure that those providers are used to taking care of sarcomas. Um, and inquire about clinical trials. Why clinical trials are important because it's really cutting edge therapy to trying to determine what is the best, best treatment uh, possible to answer a question, especially for these rare cancers. Uh, important is the biopsy. What is that? Uh, finding, uh, finding a representation of what exactly that tumor is because it could c drive your entire course of prognosis and treatment. What, what does that, why, why do that? Again, if you suspect that a mass is a sarcoma or a cancer, have a needle uh, biopsy taken so that one can render an opinion of what that is. Avoid having an operation where someone says, well, there's a lump, let me just take it out, and oh my gosh, it's sarcoma. Now we've left you know, tissue behind, the planes are disturbed, and so it makes it much more difficult to treat. And I always tell people, people when people want to say, well, what about surgery? And I, I don't understand sarcomas. Give me, give me an, a comparison. Well, I live in Manoa, and I have a yard, and the yard has weeds because I refuse to put pesticides, herbicides, because I have animals, I have children and whatnot. So with sarcomas, think about a weed where if you just cut the top of it, it's going to grow back right away. And so it's the same principle with sarcoma. So you, just, you don't want to just barely get around. You want to get a, a wide margin. So, but getting the diagnosis up front is extremely important first. Um, this just is a slide that says, remember what I told you, get a, get a large um, team with you of experts who know what they're doing. Uh, sarcomas are, in general are treated typically with surgery. One, two, and three, you can see that the higher stage that one gets, meaning the tumor is bigger or more aggressive on the microscope, i.e. a different, a grade, a higher grade, they will, will, those patients will get much more than just surgery itself, more radiation or potentially more chemotherapy. Now we're even using immunotherapy to treat sarcomas and targeted therapy. Uh, I already have talked about this, corner, surgery is a cornerstone, but also what's important, especially if it's a high grade, is where that biopsy site is. So if you remember where that biopsy site, you have to make sure that that area gets removed as, if, if you can remember it. Because especially if you're not going to get any other therapy, you, that biopsy site should be removed. Now I'm going to run over, um, just interest of time, a few cases. This is a gentleman that had a growth in his calf for over a year. And he finally came in and said, you know what, it's bothering me. And so he went, and before I got involved, he went and he was seen by several providers. He ended up getting chemotherapy and, uh, and radiation therapy, and I just did surgery on him. And 
right now, less than 5% of the cancer cells that were in this calf were alive. So that means he, he got a response either from chemotherapy or radiation. We're trying to determine from what. But that's why it's important to get sometimes more than one type of therapy. You want to remove it, but if, in, if it's in distant parts, sometimes you need additional types of, of therapies. This is a, a woman who had a sarcoma of her thigh. She developed it where it was a mass and it just kept growing and she didn't go and see the doctor right away. And you may say, well, what is this? What is this test here? This is called a PET scan. And for lack of a better description, I'm going to tell you that cancers, many cancers, love to eat sugar. So basically, a PET scan is it's, it's, it's tagged to a substance that is looking for sugar. And whatever is black here, so this is in the bladder, it's being excreted, excreted in the bladder. This is your brain, because your brain needs a constant supply of sugar. But this is here, the tumor in the thigh. It was a very big, big mass. But this patient got radiation first. So what we did is we got a biopsy. We found that it was high grade and felt that it was too close to the bone. And so this patient got radiation therapy first before I took her to, to surgery to try to kill some of the cells. This is a patient who uh, got targeted therapy. And you may say, well, wh what do these photos mean? Okay, well, this is a CT scan. This patient is facing you. This is the liver, which is located on the right side of your rib cage. This whole thing here is the, is the tumor. It's of the stomach wall called a GI stromal tumor. It's extremely big. This is a kidney that it's pushing on. And so the patient got this drug. Remember I told you Gleevec or imatinib, And that helped to make surgery a little bit easier. It softened the tumor. Sometimes the tumor may not shrink, but it, if it kills the cells, it makes operating a little easier and it makes the surgery less extensive. So it was able to save quite a bit of the stomach, believe it or not. This is a... Uh, an example of buttock sarcoma metastatic to the heart and lymph nodes. And I'm not going to steal this person's thunder, but he's going to share a little bit about, you know, what he went through. But this is a, a scan, and a, a, a CAT scan, and the patient is laying down, but this is the, the area near the butt, buttock here in the soft tissue. That's sarcoma. This is a PET scan showing in all this bright spot that's active cancer. And then this area here, this smaller area here that I'm showing you, this is a lymph node in the groin. This is the type of sarcoma that can go to the groin, called an epithelioid. And you may say, well, what, what is this other, um, what is this spot here? There's a spot here. That's the heart. This patient had a metastatic deposit to the heart. Okay, so this is found on PET scan. This is a patient who was sent to me with a large tumor. This, all this here is a liposarcoma. This tumor was 43 centimeters and it weighed 30 pounds. Okay, and this is the, the CT scan, again, facing you. This is the liver here, and this is the, a vein here called the inferior vena cava. So that drains a lot of the blood from your body uh, to your heart. But this right here, was the tumor all this this is all fat and you may say well how do i know it's fat this right here is subcutaneous tissue right under the skin you see how it kind of looks alike so that's fat this was a liposarcoma but because it's deep in the abdomen remember i told you sometimes patients present with a lump under the skin it's hard to find so this thing was 43 centimeters this patient had a desmoid tumor. Now, a desmoid tumor is not necessarily a sarcoma, but sometimes it's classified within it because they're, they're soft tissue cancers. They grow um, under the skin. And this, as comparison, this thing was the size of a, a, of a small football. But the patient had an operation before three years ago, and, and it basically did not get a, a wide margin, so it just grew back like a weed. And I had the chance of removing it. I can't show you the gross pictures, the operative, because it's, it's too graphic. But this, all this here was tumor. And it was right on his, in his chest, chest wall, right over his ribs. But he recovered, but this is a desmoid tumor. 
So a desmoid tumor is classified as a soft tissue type of tumor, but is not technically a cancer, because what makes something a cancer is that it can spread. That's what makes things cancerous. But this, these can behave aggressively because they grow like a weed, just locally, just around, and makes it very hard to take care of. Um, and then I just want to go over, just introduce you to the, the folks here who are going to be talking about their stories, but Ms. Esposito had a myxoid fibrosarcoma, okay, and Mr. Lopes had an epithelial sarcoma. So these are, this is how it looks under the, mic the microscope. Remember, there's over a hundred different subtypes. So before you hear from them, I just want to leave you just with a few reminders. Sarcomas are rare. They're heterogeneous, meaning there's so many different types, and it's complex. But just like anything, anything in life, just because they're rare, that doesn't make it that it's not important. It's still extremely important. We can learn a lot from this type of cancer. High index of suspicion if, the ma if you notice a mass that is large, firm, and fixed. Large, firm, fixed. Getting a biopsy is extremely important. So before somebody just removes something, if it meets this criteria of being large, again, large, get a golf ball, firm and fixed, you can't move it, really think about getting a biopsy first because it could alter your prognosis, your treatment, and, and potentially save a lot of, lot of anguish. Um, I will tell you that the staging system has been revised. Um, staging is just a way of telling us one through four, is it locally in this area? Did it go to a lymph node or did it spread to other organs? If it's spread to other organs up front, then we typically give chemotherapy first and not necessarily surgery, although in general in stages one, two, and three, surgery is, is the, the first line of treatment, whether it's before or after other types of treatment. But in, typically for stage four, we do not do surgery unless on, in certain circumstances, and, and uh, you're going to hear that from Mr. Lopes. Um, multidisciplinary care is essential. Get everybody on board. We have, in fact, this morning we had discussions on uh, several sarcoma patients today. We all, we get a room, we meet regularly, we go over the slides, we go over x-rays, we get opinions, and sometimes we disagree. And it's okay to disagree. We, you know, we have a discussion. We try to come with some type of consensus. And just to emphasize again, surgery you want to remove is a cornerstone of therapy. So that's why I see quite a bit of sarcoma patients. And it does take a team effort. Uh, these are many folks here. I don't want to name their names because there's just too many. And, um, but they're all kidding aside, they, they're very important in helping me get all the patients uh, in and getting taken care of. So without further ado, thank you for your, your time. I'm going to uh, invite, uh, uh, maybe Lisa can, can lead this, but we're going to have Ms. Esposito and Mr. Lopes come on, come, come upstairs, uh, up here on the stage and, and share their stories. And then at the end, we're going to have some time for Q&A. David, if you can take the stage. And then Dr. Morita, if you could sit down there too. Okay, so we're going to start with Donnie Esposito sharing her story with sarcoma. Go ahead, Donnie. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my story, uh, I, I learned a lot just listening to Dr. Marita tonight about sarcoma. I didn't know a lot of things. Um, I, uh, I discovered, a, I, I was taking a nap. And I met this masseuse who told me to lie on your side, don't cut off the blood supply in your arm, but lay, always lay your arm on the bed and put your arm here. And I did that, and I felt a lump that I didn't remember at all. Two years prior, I had gone to a surgeon, and... Uh, they, that surgeon had removed a, a lipoma or a, a fatty, benign, you know, lump or tissue from my lower back. So I went back to the, the same surgeon, and they uh, felt it and measured it, and they determined that it was a lipoma. 
So that surgeon said, uh, no problem. She said, uh, because what's going to happen is I've already ordered a machine and it'll be taken out very easily. So we'll make this a simple in-office procedure. Just keep checking back with me every single month because the machine's not here yet. So that happened in November of 16 when I found it and I called every month and finally by May uh, it was stuck in the Queen's approval process and it was here uh, but not in her office. I was getting ready to go to lunch with uh, my general manager and uh, I had a sleeveless dress on. I was, I was running out and I, I, I was putting on some earrings in, in the bathroom and I just glimpsed at myself in the mirror, in my back, and there was this larger lump. I mean, it had doubled in size in about six months. So I called the surgeon back and I said, hey, you've got to see me this week, please. So I told her what happened. So she said, please come on in. She felt it, measured it, and she said, you know what, the lipoma is so large now, I can't do it with the machine. And she said, we're gonna put you in the OR. I said, just do it. And so she did. She, she took it out, uh, stitched it up, and then I got a phone call at home three days later, uh, and the nurse said, she, uh, doctor needs to see you. And so she pulled out results. I thought she was taking out stitches early or something. But uh, she said, uh, it's cancerous. And uh, I just, you know, I, I don't think I heard anything anymore, you know, in the conversation. And she said, I'm going to have to refer you to an oncologist. He's really good. Uh, he's a good guy. His name is Shane Morita. She said, don't freak out because you're going to walk into the cancer center at, at Queens. Uh, she said, but this, I just want him to talk to you, you know, and, and just, just hear what he has to say. So I, I went to see Shane a few, few weeks later, and I went with my girlfriend, thank goodness, uh, because once again, I just, I didn't hear anything after a few moments, and my girlfriend, Patty, just became my ears, you know, in, in that in that meeting. And uh, so he reiterated, showed me the same results that I had seen, and on paper. And he said, um, I, "I'll draw a picture for you," which was really helpful. And he, you know, he, you know, that tissue that they put, you know, on on the table. Uh, he drew. Uh, he said, "It's it's like an avocado." He said, I'm going to tell you what we're going to have to do. Uh, he said, when the surgeon took out the, uh, what she thought was a uh, benign tissue, what it was was cancerous. And I remember you saying, I'll never forget you saying, and you never touch a sarcoma because she had taken out it, taking it out in piece by piecemeal, and I said, "Is that the normal way to take something out?" And he said, "Yes. Yeah, I mean, some some surgeons do that, but this was cancerous. So what I'm going to have to do, because it's probably spread, and she there's some residue left over of of cancer in there. I'm going to have to cut around the avocado and take out some of the meat." And um, that's what we did. Uh, and he expedited things because I had resigned from a job. I had medical to the end of the month. And I said, I need to get the surgery, you know, by the 29th of June. And, I mean, it was all set up. And he said, I'm going to tell you that um, this is going to be a very large area that I'm going to have to work on. And it's about that big. And he said, so it's going to necessitate um, plastic surgery. So uh, they'll take some skin from another part of your body. It's, they took it from my thigh. And uh, I uh, had the surgery on the 29th of June last year. 
with Dr. Marita, and then a week later, I had gone to um, a plastic surgeon, and um, yeah, she had uh, she did a really good job. Uh, but um, yeah, it's it's kind of a weird looking thing. I, I still think it's strange looking. Uh, it uh, they put the skin through a mesh machine and stretch it. And there's kind of a design to this skin. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what happened. That's, that's what happened. Thank you for sharing that, Donnie. Yeah. Is there, having gone through the journey, is there something you want to make sure the audience knows? Yes. Uh, like Dr. Marita said, uh, don't wait. Um, and what I had hoped I would have done was insisted on a, a biopsy because not only did was my family history of cancer there, um, but it was a simple, it was a misdiagnosis. And I, I, I really believe that. Um, and it should not have gone on growing for six months and I should have watched it a little bit more carefully myself, you know, rather than wait till it doubled in size. Uh, I, I should have done that. Um, okay, thank you, Donnie. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to go to David Lopes, Jr., if you could share your story. Hi, my name is David Lopes. Um, growing up within a family of cancer, I didn't think it would have affected me, but... About three years ago, um, I am a part-time teacher, or was a part-time teacher at Makaha Elementary, and I was teaching kindergartners, my kindergartners, the alphabet song in Hawaiian, and we were going into colors, and I told them, you know what, let me grab a chair, I'm going to sit down, since you guys are sitting on the floor, I'm going to sit down, and then we're going to talk about the colors. I sat down, and I felt pressure on my left butt cheek. At that time, I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was just weird. I sat down wrong or, you know, something just pushed differently. So I adjusted myself on the chair, talked to my students, went home. For about a week, I could not sit on my left cheek. I, and I thought it was strange, so I went to the doctors. Doctor told me, okay, we're going to take a biopsy, and we're going to send you to Queens to get the biopsy done. I got a call a day later and said, we're not going to do it at Queens. We're going to do it in my office. And I was like, great, it's much closer to my house. I can go. Went to the doctors, got the biopsy done, and I waited three days. He called me up personally, and he said, come in. We have to talk. And I said, right now? He's like, when you're done with everything, I'll wait for you. Just come in. Went into his office, and he sat there with his nurse. And he said, we have something that we have to talk to you by yourself. And I said, okay. I told my wife, wait for me outside. I'll be right with the doctor. And shouldn't take two, more than five minutes. That five minutes turned into one hour. Because the life just, the bomb just dropped when he told me I had chordoma cancer at first. That was what the diagnosis was. When he said cancer, my brain just shut down, and I thought about my entire family that passed away about, from cancer. So going home, I was real quiet, wouldn't talk to my wife, went home, and I said, you know what, give me 10 minutes by myself. I need to do something on the computer. I went on the computer, and I looked on everything on Cordoma. If you look on the Internet, I promise you, you will find everything negative about cancer. You will not find one good story unless you really do a thorough research going in through links. You will always find something negative first. You will never see a great lining about cancer. With me, I found out with Cordoma, I would have four to five years to live. Great, another bomb just dropped into my life calling back the doctors, going back a week later, and this was happening rapidly in 2015, um, October, November, and December. January, um, at my last visit with that doctor, because he was referring me to Dr. Marita already, he said, 
I don't know anything much about Cordoma, but we're going to change, uh, change you over to Dr. Marita, best, best doctor there at the Queen's Cancer Center. I said, okay, let's get it done. Now, mind you, the moment before I got to see Dr. Marita, my household was very quiet. That was the day I told them I am seeing a cancer specialist, who is Dr. Marita, and um, I need to tell you guys what happened. After I told my family what had happened, for one whole day, I acted like a five-year-old on triple tons of chocolate and sugar. I threw a tantrum. I destroyed my room. My wife told me, you have to clean it. You have to do everything yourself. Um, I did not want to talk to my own kids. I did not want to talk to my family members. I did not want to talk to anybody who had cancer and was still alive. I made it to a point where I was like, okay, I am done. My life is over. That one whole day, 24 hours, I threw a tantrum. I would not speak to anybody. Just destroyed my room, destroyed whatever I could get my hands on. After that 24 hours, I sat myself down. My body started to adjust. I breathed, and I took my time, and I said, you know what? Throwing a tantrum is not going to get me anywhere. Go to see the doctors go to see what I need to get done. And from that point on, I saw Dr. Marita. I saw a radiation specialist and an oncologist. Now, if it wasn't for these doctors, I would not be here sitting today because they did such a tremendous good work. I've had three surgeries with radiation and chemotherapy. I've, I was like one of those naked mole rats, you know, bald from head to toe. But... I'm a walking chia pet. This is, you know, literally almost a year after surgery, and it's full-on vengeance again. I loved being bald. Trust me, I loved being bald. It was easy. Wash and go. That was it. <laughs> but with my surgery, it really was the cancer. I'm a, what they had before the revision was stage four. I was stage four cancer because it metastasized or it moved. My first area was my left butt cheek. Now, I'm going to get really gross on you, but if you take your thumb, your left-hand thumb, if you can reach your butthole, and you stick your finger there on the butthole, and you squeeze with the rest of your fingers your butt cheek, if you paint your, your finger in the middle, that's ex about the area where the cancer was. I thought it was the most ridiculous spot to have the cancer in. It's there's a lot of patients who have the cancer in that section. It was the size of a dime when I first found it. Three months later, the size of a dollar coin. Um, six months later, almost the size of my fist. So it rapidly grew. And from that expansion, it went to the crotch area of my left leg. The bikini line for you men over there, that's the most tender spot of the leg for the men. But that's where another spot happened. It was called epithelioid sarcoma. Yeah, to my lymph nodes. And it was the size of a, I would say, maybe a nickel at best by feel. Hard, very, very much stable but because it moved from one area of my butt cheek to the thigh, I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't even tell them until like months later. But then the one that moved to my heart is what scared me. The muscle wall of my heart, it moved to that area. If you look at a picture of a heart, the muscle wall area, it was protruding outwards. It wasn't protruding in. The surgeon that helped me remove it took literally said, I'm just going to make a slice, shove the camera in to see and diagnose what I can and cannot do. He went in, and I was under the knife and under the impression that if he was going to remove anything, they would crack open my chest. Because that was the only way they would get to it. He literally said, no, all he did was push the muscle aside, looked at it, went in with the claw, and that was it. He removed it. So this one was removed. With Dr. Marita, the other two was moved within three months' time, right? It was May was my first surgery. It was the crotch area. And then in August, June, July, August, yeah? August was the butt cheek. Now, 
I was sent to a plastic surgeon to tell me that they're going to remove the skin or either leave the skin open and put some stuff in to let it heal that way so it doesn't hurt me in any way and then I'll be in the hospital for months because of infection wise and all that but I went to see a plastic surgeon and I told her I want a Van Dam booty because you know the 1980s he had that bubble butt so if you could make it nice you know in the back there I'd be perfectly happy which was great it's my way of dealing with it is to make jokes every day laugh my advice to you you find a lump get it checked don't be afraid of going to the doctors if the doctor tells you you have cancer find a family member that you can sit down with vent find someone you can vent with it makes all the best difference in the world if not we meet and greet outside you want to get to know me i have email send me an email and i will talk to you if you want to talk if you're afraid of something don't be my life right now easy peasy as long as there's cheesecake and shopping life is grand I don't take it where to the point now before meeting with Dr. Marita then he could tell you I was yelling I was telling do things now get it done with now I'm like okay easy chill you want to do something give me the paperwork sign it let's do it I'm not afraid anymore I've accepted what's come to me and it's easier I have a support system I can vent to a lot of people in my household but only certain points of my life I can vent If it's about the cancer, I have only one place to go, and it's my Hanai sister. That's it. Life is so easy and grand for me. It's not. It is scary going through life as a cancer patient, but don't be afraid to get everything checked. I don't care if you have a small lump, a big lump, get it checked. Don't be afraid. That's my advice to you. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid going to your doctor and saying, "Okay, I have this. Can you check, please?" Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's what they're there for. And if you feel like you have a rundown point of life, find someone you can talk to. They can help you. You the more you talk, the more life gets easier and less stressful. And if you have family members who are going through cancer, better yet, you have a partner in crime, go shopping. Eat with cancer patients. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long, but with cancer patients they forget you sometimes they're so scared depressed they don't eat they don't like to do anything make sure you eat it's the best thing in the world it keeps your strength up move do something cuz life will treat you good thank you mm-hmm. thank you so much david rita so we're going to open the floor up to questions now if you have a question raise your hand hi hi I'm sorry, I can't. Sorry. Does treatment cause infertility? Does treatment cause infertility? It can. Some of the chemotherapeutic agents do, so that's why it's important to even think about, you know, bank banking. So all those, and that's why, like I had mentioned, it takes a real a huge team. You know, there's a lot of financial concerns, a lot of social concerns. It's not only the therapy, but just what what goes around it. So. Does it impact so, other some, family members? Some of them, you know, some of those syndromes I mentioned, Lee Fermini, there's a gentleman that I just had taken care of, and his mother had died in her 20s from a brain cancer. Um, and, and he had a different, he had a stomach cancer, but he's at risk for a sarcoma. So that's why it's important also, I, di- I, didn't, I, I, I didn't put it up there, but also see, a, you know, really, especially in young, because if you could reveal your age, I'm 43 going on 44. You, you know, we're all we always our thought well these patients have to be you know elderly to get cancer but that's not necessary but to really get a, you know sit down with a, a genetics team to go over you may discover something and you may need testing if you have uh kindred. Okay, we have a question up there. Uh yes, Dr. Mar- this is for Dr. Marita. Uh I discovered a lump uh, right below my left breast. I had I went to my uh, internist then he referred me to a surgeon okay the uh, internist had me go have a uh, ultrasound uh 
the breast exam, and also a CAT scan, but they didn't see anything. Do all cancers show up on a lot of these tests? You know, that'd be, I mean, if you can feel a lump, you should be able to see something on the, on the imaging. You know, sometimes normal tissue can mimic, like normal fat cells can mimic, but if you can feel something, you should be able to, to see, see something all, on the x-rays. Yeah, you know, all the uh, imaging didn't show anything, but I still feel the lump. The technician felt the lump, mm -hmm. the surgeon feels the lump, but so basically I should get a biopsy. Yeah, I mean, you should, there, I mean, if you can feel something, we typically will get either an ultrasound or a CT, you know, what we call image guidance right. to help to make sure we're very precise and, ha and have it sampled. It could be just normal, normal tissue that's just a little enlarged, but usually tumors are, a vast majority of them are, are spherical, so in that location, but I would definitely maybe suggest getting a biopsy. Okay, thank you. We have a question here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing your experiences. Uh, Dr. Morita, you mentioned that the first uh, risk factor is radiation. Uh, what do you know about uh, uh, flight crews that uh, spend a lifetime up in the uh, you know, stratosphere as far as radiation affecting or yeah. increasing ch cancer chances? So for sarcoma, I, there's no data for that, but there is some concerns that if you're an airline pilot, you have an increased risk of melanoma because you're closer, you know, with the ozone, you're, you're just closer to the elevation. So melanoma, and that, that's been well reported in the literature, of melanoma increased risk in, in, in sort of folks who are in the travel industry, do a lot on, in the airlines, but not, not sarcoma. Okay, we have a question there. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very enlightening. Uh, the question I want to ask for anyone but uh, feel free to decline answering if mm -hmm. it's too personal. I'm curious about the financial challenges and the insurance behind uh, going through your journey and how did you overcome them? Okay. Um, I had really good insurance at that time. Um, I had taken a hiatus from Hawaii News Now, and I went to work at pl the plaza at, um, at Punchbowl. And, uh, you know, as a man, I was a manager, and for the managers, you know, there was like 100%, so I was really happy. By the time I had resigned, I was on COBRA. Um, so it really wasn't that bad. Yeah, I had the two surgeries. Um, I think it cost me... I think with an $18,000 surgery bill just for the plastic surgery, I think I paid 2000 and then the surgeon's fee for another um, about 1000 Yeah. Yeah. For me, for me, it was basically, I, my family and I are borderline right above the poverty line on our pay scale. So... I have the state medical, so state medical covers, which is fantastic because if not, I'd be paying, you know, as I put it, billions of dollars just to get me healthy. But I was lucky enough to have state medical. Okay, other questions? Again, thank you both for sharing. Uh, my, um, we have autoimmune disease and CA on both sides, maternal and paternal in my family. My sister, I believe it's leomyosarcoma, and my mother, GIST. Um, the imatinib helped my mother, uh, but uh, affected the kidneys, had impact, so she uh, passed away of kidney failure. But she was 89 when she was diagnosed, and the surgery was done here at Queens. My sister was in her 50s, and, uh, and she had MS first, and that ended her career as a ballerina. And then in her 50s, the, the um, uh, sarcoma. Um, so what does that mean for my brother and for me? You know, I would definitely get, the, you know, meet with the genetics. We have a genetic service here, so having a good dialogue, they'll go through your, your family tree. 
And again, sarcoma relatively, like again, I said, it's, if you take 100 adult cancers, only one, one patient, one of those will be sarcoma. So it's relatively rare, so it's important to get a good, thorough family history and assessment by the genetics team. As far as you, I mean, getting those type of cancers, there's no link between a gyrostoma tumor and a little mild sarcoma per se, um, but I think getting, you know, getting evaluated and, and talking would, wouldn't be a bad idea. Okay, other questions? Raise your... Oh. Hi. Um, thank you for your, um, your stories, too. That was very informative. I have a question. I um, have... Um, uh, a myxoid um, liposarcoma, which was I had gotten it taken out in um, August of last year, and um, my surgeon said, "Oh, you know, it's just uh, a level one on the higher end side, so that was a great." And that um, um, he was waffling back and forth whether I should do radiation, but in the end, a couple months later, maybe about three months later, the radiologist called their office called, and I had called in between because I asked him before if I was going to have um, radiation done, um, how soon after the surgery should I be doing it? And he said three weeks, and nobody ever called, so I called the cancer center, not at Queens, but someplace else that mm -hmm. he was dealing with, and. Um, they finally called at the end of November, and then I had my radiation done. But um, so now um, I, I went through the radiation, and then after my form, well, let me let me go back. Um, the surgeon said I had a high grade, well, a higher grade one. That's why he wasn't so concerned about radiation. But when I finally got in to see an oncologist, he said I should be concerned, and this was in May. Um, I, um, and he said that I had a level two and that I should really be proactive. And I wasn't really worried because of the first diagnosis. So when you have two different um, diagnoses, I mean, like, you should always take the worst scenario. Well, that's why I, I try to emphasize, make, make sure you have a, a team of, the, you know, the, the, that's on board with you because it's not only, there's not one person that is going to be your sole provider, and and so you know we you have to be able to work with others and try and, and make sure you get the right diagnosis, the right grading, if you will. I don't even know if there's a round cell component, for example, in myxoid liposarcoma. So, I mean, it's they're all a little little different, mm -hmm. but and that's how we have these cases presented at, at at tumor board where we we get together, but or we always are you know contacting each other communication. So. Um, as far as, I mean, we can have, you know, I'm sure we can have, you know, your case looked at, but it's more of just having that push for that communication between not only you and the, the provider, but between providers themselves. Okay, so my oncologist, um, I'm a proactive oncologist now, and so he's put me to the um, CD scans and to the MRIs. Mm -hmm. and. Um, originally, I didn't notice that I had another lump upper on my upper arm, on the same arm that um, I had the sarcoma uh, removed. And um, so when he ordered the scans, and the, like the MRI, he was only going to do the forearm. And then when I discovered that I had this upper part, um, mm -hmm. these lumps up here, then he, um, he um, ordered for the whole arm to be, you know, um, mm -hmm. MRI, have an MRI on it. Then, um, because it, the results came back, I mean, the CT scan came back as there's nothing in my lungs or anything, because that's apparently a common place for it to evolve that's right. um, if it reappears. <clears throat> so I was clean on that. And then um, with the MRI, they did, they did come back with um, um, a mixoid, you know, sarcoma up, uh, on my upper arm. And then, so then he did a PET scan, because he said that generally tells him where else it could have metastasized to. Um, so now um, he has found that through that PET scan, it's only on that arm, the upper arm. So um, I've asked him actually to um, to see if um, what the prognosis would be, sending my things to MD Anderson, the cancer clinic, because apparently they um, specialize in sarcomas. So we're waiting for results from them to come back to us, and then thinking of um, what we're going to do with this. But my question, too, is also, like, after you have surgery, um, how do you normally, like, um, do, um, or does it depend on the grade as to how you would go about with chemotherapy and radiation? 
That's correct. It depends on the stage, the grade, and, and as these folks will tell you, they've, they've seen many other doctors besides me. Reconstructive surgery, even a medical college that says, okay, you don't need anything. You, you, you know, it's just important to get everybody on, on board up front. If you have any more questions, you can ask them after and you can talk to you. We have one more question here. Hi, okay. um, thank you for your, sharing your stories. I guess I had a question. Um, my cousin had breast cancer, and I guess you know she had to remove. And I guess to me, I wonder, being that she had that and went to chemo, um, she would maybe be subject to other things. And maybe a year ago or so, she, by her temple, she um, felt like pain, and so she went to the doctor and then they only did a CAT scan and they said, oh, you know, like they couldn't really find whatever. And um, two weeks ago, we just heard that um, she has stage four cancer. Uh, the cancer went into her stomach. She had, and it went into her back bones. And so now she has bone cancer also. And then she just found out that it's also in her lungs and her liver, but she's stage four. And, and I guess um, then they checked her, they did an MRI again on her temple, and it was pain because it's in the bone. Mm -hmm. So my question is like, if she already had cancer, I mean, you know, I guess if they did CAT scans or something, I mean, why don't they monitor these people more carefully with MRIs or something? Because, I mean, she's at stage four already. You know, I, I, I don't... I, I would, I don't know the type of, I mean, all cancers you are, there's different protocols. It depends on the stage, depends on some of these other factors. I, I, I only be speculating. I mean, CT scan should be able to detect things um, as good as, about as good as an MRI. Um, I like MRIs for sarcomas because it gives a little bit better view of the, the tissue, but also spares somebody getting unnecessary radiation. So. I'm sorry to hear that, but okay. How about another round of applause for Dr. Marita, Donnie, and David for sharing tonight? I also want to say mahalo to our Queen's volunteers, Lon Nguyen and uh, Maya Bonilla in the audience. Thank you so much.